It has taken me many years to tell this story out of both fear and embarrassment. I share this today as more than simply therapy for myself, but as a warning to all people. Be careful who you meet on social media. In 2018, my ex-husband and I were at the end of a very tumultuous marriage. He and I had been polyamorous for about three years before I met this guy. His name was Jez. I met Jez on OkCupid. I was 28 and he was 42. We hit it off very quickly. After a few weeks of talking, I agreed to meet up with him at a restaurant close to my house. We sat and talked for a few hours before I invited him over to meet my husband. Things went very well and they seemed to get along. So Jez and I started dating. This guy completely sweeps me off my feet. Jez was sweet and caring. He enthusiastically listened to every little thing on my mind, engaged and validated me. Over and over again, he absolutely revered me for my strength and wisdom. He practically worshipped me for all that I was and all I was becoming. He showered me with gifts, flowers, and random good deeds just to make me feel safe wanted and cared for. I'd never been in a relationship that felt quite like that. It was wonderful. It was as though we'd been looking for each other for years. After the first few weeks, he had a meltdown over my polyamorous nature. He pulled the plug because he said he was already falling for me and couldn't handle sharing me. I stood my ground and accepted this boundary and the fact that I would have to let him go. I left that night sad, but confident that I'd done the right thing for the both of us. The next week, he sent me flowers and a card to my workplace, begging for another chance, and reassuring me that he would rather try than not, and end up regretting it. Even though it was scary, he wanted to take this journey with me. We continued dating, and it was just as wonderful. Long nights we spent awake, talking, sharing, laughing lovemaking and planning. We went places and did things that I'd always wanted to do. Then, in the deepest, most intimate moments, we would just sit there in silence. He would grip my hand to his face in solidarity and astonishment, asking, where have I been all this time? Our time together was effortless. We fit together like puzzle pieces. By August of 2018, my marriage had ended, by no fault of Jez's, and by October, my husband had moved out. I was on a lease at the time and knew I couldn't afford the place on my own, so finding a roommate was essential. I had no support system to fall back on, nor did anyone else I know need a place at the time. So, Jez offered to move in. Even though I was hesitant, we'd only been together about four months, and I knew everything always changes when you move in with a partner. Despite my hesitation, I agreed. He was wonderful to me. How bad could it be? I was not prepared for the change that was to come. It was literally like night and day. Jez suddenly became a different person. He was extremely controlling, jealous, and lazy. Nothing like the person I thought I'd met and the way he treated me progressively got worse and worse. Hanging out with my friends became a burden, if not impossible, because he would blow up my phone, guilting me about leaving him alone or not involving him in some way. Yet when I tried to, it was also treated as a burden and inconvenience, as he would huff and puff his way through even the concept of leaving space for anyone but ourselves. In December of 2018, we attended my work Christmas party. I'd given him the option whether he wanted to go or not. It was really neither here nor there for me, especially because I'd already learned that he really didn't do well if he felt pressured into social situations. I opened the invitation to him because he'd expressed to me over and over that it was important for him that he was involved in my social life. For the full month he knew about it, he insisted that he wasn't going. I took it as him being introverted and didn't push the issue. I let him know that I would make sure he felt welcome if he decided to go, but not to feel obligated. I was surprised when he changed his mind at the last minute and insisted on going. 
and even more stunned when we went, and he actively acted as though he did not want to be there. Everyone there was incredibly welcoming, and included him in the festivities and conversation. However, he still practically grumbled the entire night about the whole thing, mumbling insults and critiquing every little part of the party under his breath, as though being there was absolutely awful to have to endure. No one really seemed to notice the low whispering insults and gripes. At one point, after a couple of glasses of wine, my direct manager leaned into Jez and started praising him. She and I were very close, therefore she was intimately familiar with what I'd gone through with my ex-husband. I am so, so happy she has you. She bleeded through wine happy. You have been absolutely transformative for her. It's so nice to see her finally happy and appreciated. Without missing a beat, Jez grimaced at the comment and quickly snapped back. You don't fucking know me. I honestly didn't believe my ears. It was one of those moments where time stops and you just know you couldn't have heard that correctly. I sat, brewing on it for a minute, before another light-hearted interaction with Jez prompted me to suddenly snap at him through grit teeth. Stop it. This triggered me and I lost it. I pulled him outside and asked him what his problem was. I called out his behavior and told him if he was going to act that way then he could just leave. That if he didn't want to be there, he should have stayed home. He ended up giving a sort of half-assed apology and we went back inside and finished the party. I remember the drive home that night, staring out the dark window at nothing in particular. In worried silence, I might have messed up, was my only thought through the entire drive. This all started out slow, of course, like waving me away or invalidating my experiences and ideas due to my age, that I was just dramatizing my experiences because I was young, that kind of thing. The man who, not six months prior, had validated me, my trauma, and experiences to the ends of the earth. Now every time I started a story or tried to share anything, even trying to plan out meals for the week, he would openly show annoyance as though I was violating his time and attention. Before I knew it, he was snapping at me over every little thing. If I asked how his day was or talked about my day, he would aggressively shut it down. Why do you always ask me that? I don't want to talk shop at home. I really don't care about your work. It's work. Before I knew it, I couldn't even bring him a plate of breakfast without being snapped at. It was as though he was testing me. When Jez and I first started dating, he flat out refused to talk about most of all of his exes. He refused to name them or discuss any of the issues or lessons learned. They didn't matter, he would claim. They weren't in his life for a reason. It was the same reasoning he also used in reference to my more recent exes. Talking about them, including my now ex-husband, may have well become off-limits. Anytime I brought up either of our exes, he would become incredibly agitated, belittling, and just overall very aggressive. I took this as both an age gap issue, as I have a tendency to dwell, as well as an insecurity and threat to the life he was trying to build. However, after he moved in and this hot button topic had been established several times, he would bring up his exes and how they looked, telling me on more than one occasion he would have never dated me back in the day, and that I was lucky he lowered his standards. I didn't even really know what to say to this. I would laugh it off and shove it in my back pocket, noted. He then started bringing up my looks and accusing me of catfishing him. I'd stopped taking care of myself due to the isolation and had also put on some weight, so most of my clothes that I'd once felt great in no longer fit. And since Jez had also been dishonest with me about his financial position, he was always needing extra money here and there, leaving me broke almost all of the time. The horrible tragedy happened that following summer while Jez and I were together. I received notice that a good friend I went to school with shot himself in the head while tripping on LSD. 
Our whole class was devastated. He was, without contest, the best photographer of our class, and one of the most kind-hearted individuals I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Also, as someone who is very familiar with LSD, I was rocked. Jess, however, was far from supportive. He pretty much immediately shrugged it off. That's life. I guess that's what he gets for fucking around with LSD. I was baffled at such an unsympathetic response, and even more later when Jess started to interrogate me about my relationship with this guy, asking when the last time it was that I'd ever talked to this friend. You don't even know this guy anymore. Who cares? I broke up with him for the first time after he called me at work, raging. I was busy, so I wasn't able to answer right away. But once I was finally able to answer, I was met with intense anger. It was storming and one of my dogs was having an anxiety attack due to storm and separation anxiety. This wasn't the first time and he was well aware of what she needed in those moments. Why the fuck aren't you answering my calls? You answer when I call you. I don't care where you are. He went on for a few minutes, calling me a shitty girlfriend and laying into me over my sudden distance and lack of communication while I was at work. At this point, I was done and I lost it. I tore into him over everything, especially causing problems for me at work. That being in my life is a privilege, and if he's going to wake up every day acting like he hates me, then I don't know what on earth he's even doing with me. I told him that I expected him to get his things and leave. I didn't want him there when I got home, and we could coordinate times for him to come and get the rest of his stuff. He flat refused, suddenly victimizing himself, claiming he had nowhere to go. How dare you make me fall in love with you? How dare you take me to meet your father and then dump me? My manager and her husband ended up following me home that evening because she was concerned for my safety and it offered to let me stay with her for a few days. I will never forget the scene I walked into, like Theon Greyjoy begging for his life. My boss stood next to me, watching as this 42-year-old man crawled on his knees before me, begging for mercy and communication. At one point, wrapping his arms around my legs, crying into them. I can't believe this is happening. She's the love of my life, you know that, he cried to my boss. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. This was the antithesis of a heartless person I'd been spending my days with, I shook him off and went to the back of the house, gathering enough of my things to get me through the next few days, as well as any and all valuables I could think of. It took a few days, but after about a week, Jess started blowing up my phone, apology after apology. Suddenly, he was the man I met again, full of humility and self-awareness. He acknowledged the awful way he had treated me, and sent me walls and walls of well-thought-out messages, psychoanalyzing his own behavior, where it comes from, and the ways he knows it needs to change. I took him back. Like a dumb, desperate girl, I took him back. It wasn't long into the second round that he started to guilt me over the breakup. My panic had damaged his relationship with the people in my life and he made sure that I knew it was my responsibility to fix it. It wasn't long after this that my car ended up breaking down at a gas station close to home. There was a very nice couple in the vehicle next to me that came to my rescue and checked things out under my hood. The gentleman turned out to be a mechanic for a living, so we had a good theory about what could potentially be going on. By this time, I'd already attempted to contact Jess to let him know what was going on and where I was. It wasn't long till he got off work, so he told me to sit tight and he would be there shortly. Meanwhile, this sweet couple stayed put and kept me company while I waited. Jess barreled in about 15 minutes later, completely ignoring the couple that had helped me. Touching base, the gentleman handed me a slip of paper with a name and phone number on it reviewing what he thought was going on with my car, before Jez butted in, cutting him off. I said she's fine, he snapped. I could see the woman out of the corner of my eye slink away at this comment, 
and get into the passenger seat of their car. I could feel the sudden tension, like maybe she's been here before. The gentleman didn't move and shifted his attention to me as Jess walked into the store. I could see he was clearly concerned. Are you okay? He asked in a low, almost whisper. You don't have to answer that, but if you need anything. He looked down at the number in my hand and nodded to it. Seriously. With that, he got into the driver's seat of his car and drove away. I thought about that couple countless times since that night. Everything went right back to the way it was before, as though the initial breakup never even happened. The same eggshells, the same belittling. If anything, it was worse, because I had permanently damaged our relationship. If I had just not been so dramatic, if I didn't run away from everything, then maybe he wouldn't have to work so hard for respect in my life. One night, we got into an argument. I don't even remember what it was about, but I had to be up early for work the next morning, so I paused the argument in order to get some sleep. When I went to lay down, I heard the TV turn on. I have a soundbar, so the volume can get pretty loud. Jess proceeded to turn the volume up, and up, and up far past any volume I ever pushed those same speakers to, even for parties. The walls were reverberating with the sound of the TV at astronomical volumes. Jez then started laughing hysterically. It was a laughter, manic with anger as though something might be funny on TV, but he might also jump through a window right now. I remember laying in bed, absolutely horrified at what was happening. I knew things had gotten bad, but now I was scared. I got out of bed and asked him to turn it down, to which he responded, scoffing, I'll watch TV if I fucking want to, and turned it up even louder. I felt like I was in a horror movie. I started crying at this point, begging him to please, please just let me sleep. He started mocking me and calling me names for crying. Oh, wow. Uh, Poor baby is crying again. That's your card, isn't it? Crying. This caused the fight to start again, and he started screaming at me, followed me to my bedroom, where he suddenly punched a door not two inches from my head. His eyes were black, and he looked me in the eye, sending the clear, unsympathetic, and hostile message that that was a warning, and next time he wouldn't miss. My whole system had shut down at this point, and I sunk to the floor in a panic attack. My ex-husband had issues with violence. Jez knew that. All of our rentals prior to that one had holes in walls and doors peppered throughout our unit due to my ex-husband's inability to handle his emotions. But he never hit me, or even came close to it. I crumpled to the ground, feeling powerless, trapped, and afraid. As my thoughts continued to race, he continued to berate and mock my panicked state. Most of our argument from that night was a blur, but ended abruptly once he threatened to put my social security number on the dark web. At this point, all that was left in me was to fight. I blacked out and went ballistic, screaming at him to get out. I felt rabid and dangerous as I screamed like a banshee for him to leave my home. It was over, and I was ending it that second. I contacted my landlord and explained what had been going on. Jez would also end up contacting her, weaving his own tail that I was moving out, and tried to have the lease transferred into his name. Luckily, since I was several steps ahead of him, my landlord didn't fall for it and contacted me immediately. She personally came and changed my locks for me, gave me the personal contact of a police officer close by in case he showed up again and took half off my rent for the next month. I am forever grateful to her for these simple acts of kindness that were above and beyond anything I would ever expect from a landlord. It took weeks for him to stop messaging me. The only reason I didn't block him was out of fear that he would show up at my house. Though I had contacts for protection, I knew I would rather get a daily apology video than have to deal with him on my doorstep. 
So they persisted, for a while, the same act from before, the love bombing, the promises, grasping at straws, trying to find the weak spot where I would let him back in, but I ignored it. It continued for weeks before he finally gave up. He bowed out gracefully, stating boldly that he will always love me. I left him on red. The illusion was destroyed. It took me several years to pick up the pieces. If my divorce wasn't enough, this definitely made me lose trust in myself. I still don't understand what the end game was. In one of our last discussions, I asked him desperately, what happened to the guy I fell in love with? Chaz looked me dead in the eyes, smirked, and said, that guy doesn't exist. I told you what I had to tell you in order to get you away from that fucking asshole of a husband of yours. You were just stupid and fell for it. Jess, let's not meet ever again. I am an avid hunter. I go every season and I love it. More often than not, I don't kill any game, but I just love getting out into the woods. I don't know if you're familiar with hunting season in Pennsylvania, but during late November, rifle season is in full swing. It was already the second week of the season, and I had yet to bag any deer, so I was eager to get to it early in the morning. And I did. I normally get up around 5 a.m. and drive to my hunting spot. It's private land that my grandfather owns. Him and I are the only two who hunt on it, and the rest is posted to hunters. The only others on the land are employed on my grandfather's farm. I had originally planned on calling my grandfather when I woke up and asking him if he wanted to tag along, but the weather that morning was horrendous. Snow was pouring down and the wind was really strong. I love hunting in the snow, but it almost made me decide not to go, so I knew he wouldn't want to. The roads were really bad, so it took me a bit longer to drive there. Normally, the sun would be starting to rise by now, however, it was overcast and snowing. Regardless of the snow, I walked up to my spot. It was directly behind my grandfather's house, over a hill and back about a hundred to a hundred and fifty yards. Almost immediately upon sitting in my spot, I hear things moving all around me. Honestly, I didn't pay it much mind. It could be any number of things, but it was still pitch black, and the thought that it was a deer had crossed my mind. But there wasn't much I could do. It's not like I can shoot at it, so I just ignore it and continue to wait. It wasn't much longer after that that I began hearing something walking just over the ridge to my right. At this point, there's barely enough light to see my feet, so even if it was a deer, there was still nothing I could do. However, I could tell it wasn't a deer. I just assumed it was my grandfather walking to his spot, which is just a short walk from mine, but the lights in his house were off. And if he was hunting up here, I'm sure he'd let me know prior. But even if it wasn't him, it was a hunter, albeit hunting illegally, I still wanted to let him know I was here. So, I turn on my flashlight and pointed it in his direction, flashing it several times. Again, even if it was a deer, I couldn't shoot. So, I felt it was better to be safe rather than sorry. Nothing much happened after that. After I flashed my light, the noise stopped, which was really odd. I didn't hear them turn back, so I figured they either A. Sat down right there after seeing my light, which is considered extremely rude, or B. I didn't hear them walk off. I just assumed it was the latter. An hour or so passes, and finally the first sights of daylight start to shine through. It's still snowing, and the snow is falling in entire snowballs rather than snowflakes, so visibility is pretty limited, but I just grinned and bared it. 
I love snow, and even if I couldn't see any deer, I still found the weather beautiful. It was around this time that I noticed an odd-looking lump protruding out from a group of trees and shrubs atop the hill that separates me from my granddad's house. It was right where I heard movement earlier. It looked like a mound of dirt, however, it was sticking out from the side of a tree. So, obviously, it wasn't dirt. Naturally, I raised my rifle up to take a closer look. I could tell immediately that I was looking at the side of an older-style camouflage coat. It took a minute, but it finally clicked. That was a person over there. I just thought it was a hunter, so I didn't know what to do about it. I knew he was hunting on our land illegally, and from what I could see, he wasn't wearing anything orange, which is required of all hunters during rifle season. And I could tell just from looking, whoever this was wasn't my grandfather. I sat there for a minute, debating my next move, but I decided to call my granddad, at the risk of blowing his hunt if that was him over there. So, without taking my eyes off the guy, I pulled out my phone and dialed his number. To my dismay, my granddad picked up. I told him what was going on, so he told me he'd make his way up but I decided on my own to give the guy a whistle to let him know I see him, but he didn't react at all. After a few minutes, I started to walk up to this guy. After walking a short distance, I could clearly see this guy, who was sound asleep, tucked in between a shrub and a couple of trees. He obviously thought out where to lay down, as I would never be able to see him had his coat not stuck out. And as I thought, he had no orange on. I gave him another whistle, much louder, and he woke right up, almost immediately shuffling over to hide his exposed coat. He had a nasty, scruffy beard and a grey hat. Honestly, he looked like a harmless old homeless man, probably in his fifties. But he had a perfect view of my granddad's home from his spot and I have a pretty good idea what he was planning to do once my granddad left the house. Once this guy realized he'd been caught and saw a mad six foot five guy carrying a hunting rifle less than 10 yards away, making his way closer, his face went pale. Almost instantly, he tried to feed me some bullshit that he'd gotten lost during a drive with a group of other hunters. However, the closest public game land is miles from this spot, so I knew this was a lie. He just kept going on about how he was lost and how he fell asleep. He even went as far as to make up a fake name on the spot. I just stood there and listened, making sure he didn't make any fishy movements. I couldn't help but think about what this guy could have done to my grandfather. God knows he had the chance. And that pissed me off enough to tell the guy to shut up. That's about the point where I saw my granddad. My granddad is a tough old bastard, so my first thought was, this idiot is going to get himself killed. Luckily, nothing happened. After we got there, we practically had to drag this guy down the road, where my granddad called the cops, and I called my dad. Technically, this guy hadn't done anything yet so all we could charge him with was trespassing and stalking. That was about a month ago, and since then, I haven't heard anything else about him. I was a recent college grad and dating a guy who had matriculated in my same class. He moved out to the suburbs soon after graduating for a new, big boy job. I stayed in the city and lived in an apartment with a roommate, but, being young and in love, I would often schlep the thirty or so minutes in irritating traffic to hang and inevitably spend the night. Looking back, he rarely came to visit me, which was the sort of vibe that led me to eventually breaking things off. Anyway. My boyfriend lived in a duplex in one of those labyrinthine cookie-cutter subdivisions and shared it with two other people. 
These were virtual strangers that he'd found through Craigslist. There was one roommate who was so chill that I don't remember him or her at all. And then there was the roommate that made me uneasy and whose creepy face I can, unfortunately, conjure up clear as a bell even now. His name was Rob. Rob looked to me like an average, slightly leathery, nebulously 40-something surfer. I remember he would always be in a t-shirt with some skater slash extreme sports logo and flip-flops. He had a bit of a belly and talked in a slow, aloof way that seemed to have a smattering of condescension no matter what the subject was. Definitely a one-upper personality. The thing I can picture most about Rob was his shaggy dark brown hair and eyebrows. They were so big that they hooded his eyes and gave him a raccoon-like quality. Underneath the eyebrows were distant, empty eyes, droopy like a hound dog. When he would make eye contact, which was almost never, there was something there, or maybe something was missing, rather, and I just didn't like the way it felt. Now, something to know about me. I was pretty easy to get along with in those days. I still am affable, but I was akin to a polite Labrador back then. I was enthusiastic and full of joy. I'm not sure if that bubbliness got under Rob's skin or what, or if he was just a sadist. I was always nice to him and as considerate as I could be in their house. But, regardless, there were two occurrences that left me chilled and thinking, what did I do to this person? And the answer was nothing. Someone had the idea one night to go bowling. We piled into Rob's VW van and took off for the bowling alley. The route there was on windy country roads, and it was a dark stretch of highway. The boyfriend and I are sitting in the middle row, so far back, but not by a huge stretch. All of a sudden, I felt the van getting faster and faster. If I had to guess, I'd say 65 to 70 miles per hour. I hate reckless speeding, and I'm a bit of a baby, but I tried to keep it cool. However, when he jerked the car around a sharp curve, I gasped and heard him laughing, seemingly at me. Hey, would you please slow down? You're kind of freaking me out, I said, loudly over the thumping stereo. My tone was still friendly, but serious and obviously nervous. He turned up the volume on the radio and accelerated the van. My heart was slamming, and I was really, really scared. I got the impression that he was going faster because I was scared. I yelled at my boyfriend, Make him slow down, because he was the one who lived with this maniac. My boyfriend yelled a few times, half-heartedly, and I could tell he was embarrassed by my fear. He drove a sports car at mock speeds and loved racing. Finally, after I cried out, please, a few more times, my head in my lap, he slowed down, but not without making eye contact with me in the rearview mirror once I brought my head up. All I could see were his eyes, and I couldn't tell if he was glaring or smiling at me. Either way, it was chilling. The other incident was a few weeks or months later. My boyfriend and I were coming back from something or other, and we went to his place after. We entered through the sliding glass door that leads into the living room, and soon discovered Rob was throwing a party. There were about 20 people milling about the connected living room slash kitchen, staring at us in their unfriendly hipster way as we made our way to my boyfriend's room. Suddenly, one of Rob's party guests, who, by the way, was built like a refrigerator, decides to roid out and throw a heavy wooden chair. He threw it in the style someone might launch a shot put with a little twirl and a yard type yell as he whirled it across the room. I really think the guy was just being a drunken idiot and didn't intend for it to happen, but the chair sailed across the room and right into my left upper thigh, hard. I kind of yelped out with pain and surprised and crumpled to the carpet, my hands over my thigh. If not for the blaring music, it would have been silent as no one said anything. 
Even the guy who threw the chair just stood there with an unfixed gaze, like he was trying to see what or who he hit. And then I looked at my boyfriend's roommate. He was smiling. This time I could see his mouth, and he was smiling. It wasn't a maniacal Cheshire cat smile, but a smug, satisfied smirk mixed with utter contempt. I remember that his nostrils even flared, as if this was an unexpected rush of dopamine pleasure through his body. He enjoyed both scaring me and seeing me hurt. Finally, after much too long, my milk toast of a boyfriend whimpered, Are you okay? To which I said, No, help me up, admittedly a little testily. My eyes were watering with humiliation at the situation, the bone-deep radiating pain, everyone just staring at me, and this man I barely knew, feasting his eyes on my distress. I got out of that relationship not long after, and felt so relieved to never have to go back to that toxic vortex again. When I was a teenager, I used to go out camping by myself. I had a spot where I liked that was across a few fences from my grandparents' house in the middle of nowhere. One of the places I cut through was a pasture full of cattle. Around cattle, especially cattle unfamiliar with me, I try to be very careful to not spook them, but otherwise, cows are pretty easy going. This was about a mile from my grandparents' house, and probably about two from my destination. The one time I remember, I slipped through the fence to find the cattle already freaked out. They were insanely agitated about something I was not aware of, so I stayed well clear of them as I went through the pasture. I had a good time camping that night and packed up the next morning. As I went back into that pasture, however, there was this ridiculously bad smell. It smelled like a skunk had fought with something in a fertilizer barrel of shit, and the barrel broke open. It was awful. I tried to look around for the cows to make sure they were not going to surprise me, and I could not find them. They were just gone. There was some brush and trees, though, so I thought they were just out of sight. I keep walking through the place to get home, and the smell is so bad that I set my stuff down at the fence line and decide to investigate. Well, I found the cows. All of them were shot and ripped apart. Someone had carefully shot them in the head with a bolt gun style thing and eviscerated all of them. It also drug them all into a little shallow ravine and piled the bodies up. It was horrible. I hightailed it out of there back to my gear. My stuff was gone. As in I set it right here on this rock and it's not with an eye shot. A quick glance showed me there was not anything ripped out or fallen out. So something or someone, had picked it up while I was 200 yards away for less than 5 minutes. I think Usain Bolt would not have been able to catch me on the way home. I've never heard anything else about those cows, and I did not go back to the old camping spot again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Karen Keating V. Barry LJ Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Drakkard, 
Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.